Edmund Storms is a nuclear scientist with over two decades of experimental research in cold fusion. He's retired from Los Alamos National Laboratory and is the founder of Kiva Labs. He is the author of The Science of Low Energy Nuclear Reactions, a comprehensive survey of the field published in 2007. He has also developed the theory of the nuclear active environment as an explanatory mechanism for low energy nuclear reactions. Dr. Storms, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you very much, John. So starting out, maybe you can enlighten us a bit on your background, some of your credentials, and maybe how you got involved in the field of cold fusion. Well, I uh, graduated from Penn State with an undergraduate degree and then from uh, Washington University in St. Louis with a PhD in, in radiochemistry. And from there, I went to Los Alamos, where I spent my entire career. I was at Los Alamos working on materials that were intended to be used in uh, space for space power, uh, nuclear power in space, <clears throat> at the time that Pons and Fleischmann made their announcement. And of course, that announcement and the claims that they were making to be able to generate clean energy so easily were, were very attractive claims to Los Alamos. And so the laboratory went about with great gusto trying to replicate what they were claiming to be able to do. And I was one of those that took an interest. I had an idea how it might work. We presented that to the DOE. The DOE gave the laboratory money to fund these studies. Uh, there was probably a dozen different efforts underway. Of those, only three succeeded in producing evidence for the claims, and, and I was one of them. So it, you know, it, it's very, very per persuasive when you actually see the event happen before your eyes using apparatus that you have great confidence in. So once I was absolutely certain that this was real, I set about to understand uh, what other people had done, wrote a number of reviews, eventually uh, a book on the subject that brought together all of the uh, knowledge that had been acquired. Our, my first effort was to look for uh, tritium, and we found tritium uh, using an electrolytic cell. And then uh, on the basis of that, we were given money to set up a calorimeter and, to look for heat. And we uh, found heat, also excess energy, significant excess energy. I mean, this wasn't trivial. This wasn't near the edge of the, of the uh, sensitivity of the calorimeter. This was good stuff. So I kept interested in the field after I retired, moved to Santa Fe, built my house here alongside it is a laboratory that is occupied by my work as well as my wife's um, artwork, which you see in the background, and have continued interest in the field. Okay, great. Maybe if you could give us a brief primer on cold fusion and maybe how your concept of the nuclear active environment contributes to our understanding of the anomalous reactions that we're witnessing in these experiments? Well, the original claim was based using uh, uh, the electrolytic approach. That Hans and Fleischmann uh, exposed palladium to uh, electrolysis, and in so doing, the palladium was activated in some mysterious way, producing uh, extra energy and occasionally tritium. And we all found that the nature of the palladium was very, very important. It just didn't work with any old palladium. You had to have special palladium, and you had to treat it very carefully. Well, other people tried other techniques. Uh, at Los Alamos and then also in Russia, gas discharge was used. That, that is, instead of applying the deuterium to the palladium by uh, electrolysis, one created a plasma in a gas and then accelerated the ions thus produced to bombard the palladium and then that caused the ions to go in and certain palladium in fact did in fact produce excess energy and tritium that way and then Arata in uh, Japan uh, had an inspirational idea well why not just expose palladium to the gas without doing anything else just apply gas pressure to get the uh, 
to carry him into the palladium. So he used what's called palladium black, which is a very finely divided palladium that looks black, and uh, exposed it to palladium, uh, pal exposed it to deuterium gas, and discovered that yes, indeed, this made excess energy and it made helium. And that was the other issue. What is in fact the nuclear product that results from this reaction? Initially, it, we thought that this was essentially a variation of hot fusion, which makes neutrons and tritium and uh, several other products all with a very high energy. We weren't seeing the products and we weren't seeing the energy. So something very strange was going on. So Mel Miles, working with the Navy, set about to look for helium as a logical a nuclear product, and he found it. And a number of people since then uh, also replicated that study. The amount of helium is very close to what the amount you would expect based upon the energy. In other words, the amount of energy for helium that's produced uh, is very close to what you'd calculate based upon the mass change. 23.8 MeV per helium. On the, now, on that basis, we pretty much concluded that the reaction was very novel. It had nothing to do with hot fusion. The uh, fusion, at least with deuterium, produces ordinary helium without any radiation, very little, and occasionally tritium. So other people tried different techniques besides that, uh, th those two, and uh, also succeeded. So there's about five different variations of different techniques now that are successful in making excess energy and occasionally tritium, all without radiation. So this is a new phenomenon. This is a new behavior that's never been seen before, that has an explanation that defies present understanding, although I think I have an explanation myself, but then there are dozens of other people who also think they have explanations. So, in fact, it's the, <laughs> the effort is fairly well saturated with explanations right now. We have succeeded, I think, over the last 23 years in proving that the effect is real, that the claims, in fact, are not based upon uh, incompetence, fraud, or error. They are based upon a true behavior of nature. Now the challenge is to make this happen at uh, commercial levels, make it happen in a reproducible way, because presently it, it is difficult to reproduce. It's not impossible, but difficult. It takes great skill. Not too many people have that great skill. And it has to be produced at a rate with a high enough power to be useful as a commercial application. And that aspect of it is presently underway by several companies. So we're moving towards the eventual application of the phenomena. We're striving to understand how it works. And the reproducibility is increasing steadily. Now, how does your idea of the nuclear active environment contribute to what are, well, like you said, there's a lot of theories out there describing maybe how these reactions are taking place, but what is different about the nuclear active environment theory? Most of the theories, uh, especially early in the field, proposed that the effect was occurring within the chemical lattice itself. That is, all you had to do was add the extra deuterium to an ordinary material, in this case, palladium, and it would suddenly get it into its head that it should go nuclear, that the fusion reaction should start. That didn't make any sense. I mean, first of all, it's very obvious from broad studies of chemical behavior and also the behavior of materials over geological time that nuclear reactions do not happen normally at any significant rate within an ordinary material. I mean, we're not talking about radioactive decay. We're talking about a, a, re a reaction that is initiated spontaneously to produce another element, and in this case, deuterons coming together to make helium. That is simply not found to occur. Hans and Fleischmann made it occur, and other people since then have made it occur, but only applying rather heroic efforts. And 
at least initially, it was very, very difficult to reproduce. Better uh, understanding, better materials are now available so that that problem is, is, has re been reduced. But it demonstrates that it is not happening within the normal conditions that exist within a material, within the, the, the chemical as itself. So I coined the term nuclear active environment to distinguish between the general environment and those very special places within the material that have to be created before the nuclear reaction can occur. And I don't define precisely what those conditions are, just that they exist and we can then talk about them by using the term nuclear active environment. Before that, people had no interest in focusing on that possibility. They were only talking about what happened at the lattice in general. Now, in, in general, do you see it as a process in which the palladium lattice is cracking and then there are reactions taking place within the cracks, or is that only one element of the theory? My was to try to identify what could occur in a chemical system. I mean, after all, it's happening in a chemical system, so it has to at least be consistent with known laws of chemistry. It has to happen no matter what you do to it. There's, you take these various methods, and, and there's a number of materials besides palladium that have been found to be nuclear active. So whatever this nuclear active environment was, it had to be applicable to all of the methods and all of the conditions. And then, But of course, it had to be very difficult to produce and very rare. So I looked at all the possibilities, and by process of elimination, decided that the only thing that was universal to all of the conditions and all of the methods were nano cracks. Now these are not large cracks. Large cracks are clearly not active. Large cracks are clearly made. You can see them. They actually are a disadvantage because they allow the, the deuterium to leak out of the palladium when you use electrolytic technique. So the cracks had to be of a particularly small size, a size that nature does not like to maintain. That's what makes it so rare. But once that realization was created, it became very clear that a mechanism could be proposed that could operate in that environment. In other words, it was possible to use the unique nature of that kind of structure to support a mechanism that could in fact result in a fusion reaction. So essentially what I've done is look for where it can happen and then ask how it can happen in that place now that I've found. So that's the nature of the theory. So when you say uh, cracks, well, yes, they're cracks, but they're of a very particular size. What about experiments conducted where the lattice is, it's not so much a lattice as it is a powder? How does the nuclear active environment explain those kinds of reactions if there's no lattice for the reaction to be taking place in? As I know, the only evidence for the cold fusion effect is within condensed matter, that is, within a chemical lattice. It's been found to occur in palladium, in nickel, in alloys of palladium and nickel, uh, with other elements. It's been found to occur in titanium. It's even found to occur in certain oxides, which are called proton conductors because they can absorb a little bit of, of hydrogen. And that hydrogen can be made to move under the effect of an electric field. When that motion is initiated, extra energy is produced. So all of the conditions are within a chemical lattice of some form. And the question is, what do all those lattices, all those chemical states have in common? And that's where the nano crack, that is the crack of a particular size, has to be created, according to my view. In your time experimenting on cold fusion, what is the, uh, the largest coefficient of performance that you've witnessed, or what is the most efficient system that you've witnessed? The largest amount of heat that I've seen out of a, a cell is about, oh, seven watts extra heat. 
Now, you can't really judge that in terms of efficiency or excess energy because the experimental devices, the apparatus, is not designed uh, to operate at the highest efficiency. It's designed to try to understand what's going on and measure it accurately. Now, once the phenomena is understood and can be manipulated at will, then engineering starts to be applied to make the apparatus be totally and most uh, most efficient. So we haven't reached that stage yet. Now, the efforts that are underway to make commercial power using nickel and light hydrogen by Rossi and, and Divkarian, these are trying to uh, improve the engineering, to improve the efficiency, but even they have not even come close to the efficiency that will be possible. I mean, once this is understood, the efficiency will be 100%. In other words, these devices will make energy simply by sitting there. You have to apply hydrogen. You turn them off by taking the hydrogen away. Turn them on by putting more hydrogen in. But no other source of power will be necessary. So we'll have a source of power that will just simply stay hot for years and years or until one intends to turn off the uh, energy by pumping out the hydrogen. So it's almost 25 years since the original discovery and there's been pretty rigorous research in over a dozen countries at least. And I guess most recently there was the Defense Intelligence Agency in 2009 that was pretty comprehensive that provided a good overview of all the work being done Yet, there's still this strong resistance by the establishment against the idea of cold fusion and low energy nuclear reactions, and it's become politicized, and that seems to run contrary to the aims of science. It shouldn't be politicized, it should just be about seeking truth. So why do you think there's all this pushback, and why do you think there's still resistance in the face of a growing amount of literature, theoretical backing, and experimental work? Well. This phenomena will be incredibly disruptive to uh, not only the energy producers, but the economies of the world that are based upon extracting and selling oil and coal and uranium. So they naturally are not too happy about this competition on the horizon. And then there are also people who have taught students how nuclear interaction is expected to occur based upon what's presently known. And cold fusion says that much of that teaching is wrong. So they're not happy about this uh, new discovery. So it's a conflict with self-interest. It has nothing to do with the idealism of science or the philosophy of being open and trying to look for the best of, of all, for all mankind. It's purely an issue of self-interest. And this particular discovery threatens many important self-interest. And until it is proven overwhelmingly or it becomes commercially available through sources that cannot be prevented by these other industries, we will continue to have this objection, this, this fight against it. And it's to be expected. I mean, every single discovery that has ever occurred has always had a threat to somebody. And those people who were threatened naturally fight it. So we're seeing that now, except that it's a very large threat, and therefore it's a very large fight. And I know one of my favorite quotes is from the New York Times in the 1880s when they said that all experiments had been exhausted on electricity and that it was basically dead in the water and all the work of Edison was thoroughly debunked. And now here we are in a world completely run, completely underwritten by electricity. And over a hundred years ago, there were people that were just saying the same thing that they were saying about cold fusion now. So it's interesting to see the historical parallels, I suppose. Yeah, it's, it's the nature of human discovery. It's the nature of the human mind. It's the nature of society. And you either accept it and deal with it, uh, or 
you go down in flames because of it. You, you have to realize that people do not like change because change generally hurts uh, some people. Few people will benefit, but most people uh, are used to and have economic interest in the way things are. And they simply do not want to lose that advantage. So here we are, we have now a new discovery. And this isn't the only discovery that's, that's uh, in the works. I mean, this is a discovery that most people are aware of, but there's all kinds of discoveries in laboratories that are underway now that have not hit the uh, popular awareness that will also have absolutely overwhelming uh, effects on how we live and on the future of mankind. So you can expect many more of these coming down the pike. What are some of the most common objections that you've seen raised by skeptics to say like why cold fusion is not what the proponents think it is? Oftentimes you hear, well, the measurements were wrong, the calorimeture was wrong, sometimes accusations of outright fraud. What are the most common ones that you've experienced, I guess, in your career? and um, maybe flaws in those arguments that you see that are pretty obvious? In the, in the laboratory, there is always a potential for error. And in fact, as most uh, experiments have sufficient error in them that you have to do them several times and you have to try them different ways to be assured just in your own mind that you are actually measuring something real. So all of the objections that the skeptics made are the same objections that any scientist operating in the laboratory would, would make with respect to their own work. And the trouble with skeptics is they have the arrogant feeling that only they can figure out what these errors are and they feel obliged to tell the rest of us uh, what they only, only they can see and we better listen to them. Well, that's absolute nonsense. The people doing the work knew exactly what was, could be wrong, what was wrong, where the errors were far better than any of the skeptics did. So, yeah, their calorimeters had errors. Um, people did things that, that they didn't know they were doing to the cell, and the cell would respond in ways that made it look as if there was excess energy. For example, their power supply might be interrupted for some reason, and that would produce what appeared on the graph to look like excess energy. All of these things happened, and they had to be sorted out, and they had to be proven to be real. And that's, to some extent, why it's taken 23 years now since the original announcement in 1989 for people in general to believe that the effect is real. Those of us who are working on it in, in our own laboratories came to that conclusion much more rapidly because we had the information directly available and we could test all of these possibilities very quickly and, and, and of course in my case I also uh, studied what everybody else did I probably have the largest uh, most complete literature of anybody in the field uh, all on the computer so I can access it very quickly so I know what other people are doing and I know how they're doing it and I know how good they are so that gives me a confidence that what I'm saying is true. You touched on the subject a little bit already, but maybe we can get a little more in depth on it. Andrea Rossi and his ECAT device, and also the Defcalian reactor, the Defcalian being a more recently unveiled technology. Maybe we can get your thoughts on those individual processes as far as they've been made public. There's still obvious trade secrets that are involved, but there's been a good amount of information released. And putting aside questions about Andrea Rossi as a person, what do you think of his technology? Well, I think they have produced excess energy based upon a nuclear reaction. I think there's no question that they are following uh, in the footsteps of Pons and Fleischmann, except they're applying ordinary hydrogen to nickel. As a result, different nuclear reaction occurs, but I believe it's occurring based upon the same ba basic mechanism it's being guided by the same basic principle of nature. Now, they have succeeded in activating nickel to a degree that no one else has been able to achieve. Uh, ordinary nickel is 
totally inert. It doesn't do anything. So something has to be done to the nickel. A recipe has to be applied to cause the nickel to become nuclear active. In my view, they're simply creating a large concentration of nuclear active environment using some so far undisclosed technique. The rest of us are trying to figure out what the, what they did. They're unwilling to share that information for proprietary reasons, and also because it's very difficult to get a patent, because a patent office doesn't believe this is a real phenomenon. So they are uh, being very cautious about how much they, about how much information they release, which is perfectly reasonable. That leaves us, the rest of us, the rest of the world, in a state of frustration. A state of confusion and of course it emboldens the uh, skeptics but from what I've seen I, I believe that their claims are real I believe that they are making significant progress toward reaching a level that will be commercially important and if they don't stumble economically uh, along the way we should see actual devices uh, for sale in the not too distant future. And the Def Kalyan reactor, I, I'm not as well read on their process, but do you know anything about what they're doing and, and how they're producing their effects? There are footsteps of Rossi, who was following in the footsteps of Piantelli. It's all a part of a continuum of understanding. Def Kalyan had worked with Rossi initially, and they uh, had a separation of ways for various reasons. So the, if Carolyn went uh, on their way independently, they are using a somewhat different uh, style of reactor, but it doesn't change the basic uh, process that is ongoing that's making the excess energy. They simply perhaps are using a technique which is very easy to understand, but might be more effective than the technique that Rossi is using. They have not yet achieved the level of temperature that Rossi has demonstrated, and that's important. I mean, there's, there's really three issues here. If you're going to make something commercial, it has to be, first of all, enough energy to make it practical. And that, that is, you have to make more energy than you put in to get the apparatus to work. That's the big handicap with hot fusion. It requires so much energy to be put into the apparatus that, that the fraction that you get out in excess of that is very small so far. That makes it very unattractive. The cold fusion technique has the ability to require no energy to get it going, but the present devices does require energy, mostly to control the reaction. The reaction has a positive temperature coefficient, it wants to take off, it wants to go on its own. You have to keep it under control, and that requires putting some energy in to do that. So they are mastering that technique. The other requirement is lifetime, and so far we don't know how long these things will last. Will the nuclear reactor environment be um, have a long lifetime, or will it be destroyed over time? too rapidly to make it commercial. And then finally, you have to make the heat at a high enough energy, a uh, high enough temperature, I'm sorry. If the temperature is low, uh, you can boil water, you can heat your home, but most of the energy is used to make electricity. And if that's the use, you want to have a very high temperature so that the efficiency of converting from heat to electricity is high. Rossi has achieved a very high temperature at this point so he's well on his way to solving that problem. Now, I've heard he's having issues converting all the excess heat to electricity. So do you see that as kind of a trivial stumbling block that will be solved quickly, or is that something that is a big problem? Cold fusion simply generates heat. Burning coal generates heat. Burning oil generates heat. A nuclear power plant generates heat. All of the ways in which we get energy involve heat and except of course wind and solar but we're talking about the, the major sources of energy right now 
they all involve heat. So all you have to do is plug a cold fusion source of heat into where the source of heat is in all of the various generating plants, and you convert to electricity. Of course, you can convert to electricity all kinds of different ways uh, using diff different methods. Some are more efficient than others. Some are, some are more reliable than others. But what is presently used is incredibly reliable and, in and incredibly efficient. So it becomes fairly trivial. Once you have a, the source of energy at, say, 500 degrees centigrade, it becomes trivial to then plug it in to the present uh, generating system. Okay. Recently, at the end of July, you attended the uh, International Conference for Cold Fusion. I believe this was the 18th gathering, and it was at the University of Missouri this year. Did you observe anything that you would label as an exciting trend, something new on the horizon, some encouraging developments in the field? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Is it remaining about the same? Uh, what is your opinion? Well, that meeting was important by being held at a major university. It was important because the keynote address was given by the CEO and co-founder of National Instruments, who was essentially uh, giving endorsement to the reality of, of this effect. Many people who uh, attended now were from industry, where before they were not. So th there's clearly an inc in growing awareness within the conventional commercial establishment, as well as in academia, that this is a real phenomena that needs to be addressed. And that by itself is a watershed event, because up until then, it was to a large extent, a few of us who are labeled as fanatics or deluded or you know, true believers that were carrying the torch. Now, more and more people in industry and outside of the field are getting interested. That's what it takes to carry this into a commercial application. Now, do you see eventually uh, more governments picking up on this, or do you think most of the innovation is going to come out of the private sector? I think it's going to come out of the private sector. The, the government, especially the U.S. government, has no, absolutely no self-interest in general, that is certainly the DOE has no self-interest. Now, certain other aspects of the government, like NASA and DARPA, perhaps the Navy, they do have a self-interest. NASA needs this kind of energy for space exploration. The uh, Department of Defense needs this kind of in uh, information, this kind of uh, energy for waging war. The Navy needs it as fuel for their ships. I mean, after all, if this can be used, they're floating in their fuel. So there are local self-interests within the government, but not a general self-interest at this point. Now, other governments, uh, on the other hand, uh, have treated this differently. The Japanese have a very uh, strongly supported program that's underway because they really need this energy. They don't have other sources readily at hand. China also has a program that's underway uh, with significant support because they also are desperate to, to get energy. And this kind of energy would be ideal for them. Europe, not so much. I mean, Europe is just like the United States. They're very much committed to the conventional sources of energy. Although certain countries in Europe that have an objection to nuclear power for good reason would love to see that replaced by something as benign as cold fusion. Presently, they're trying to replace it with wind and solar. That will be partly successful, but cold fusion offers the ultimate solution. You mentioned Japan there, and I couldn't help but think about the Fukushima cleanup that is ongoing and seems to be faltering at every step. Could the cold fusion process or the transmutation process be a useful tool in contributing to the eventual, I guess, salvation of that situation? Yeah, well, that's a good point. One of the um, aspects of cold fusion that doesn't get to very much attention and is a little hard for some people to stomach is the biological aspects of it. 
Uh, certain biological systems apparently have the ability to uh, engage in nuclear reactions to cause what's called transmutation. Transmutation occurs when one element is converted to another element through a nuclear process. And this has been shown to occur in biological systems. Uh, for a long time, the work was pretty much rejected and ignored. But recent work in Russia has produced evidence that overwhelmingly supports uh, that idea. And they are, in fact, uh, uh, attempting to uh, apply it to clean up Chernobyl. So if they are successful, and if that turns out to be a way of converting a radioactive element, in their case, cesium, to a non-radioactive form, then that could, in fact, eventually accelerate the ability of nature itself to get rid of the radioactive, harmful radioactive uh, nuclear products in, in the environment. So we'll see. Uh, that's, that work is ongoing. It is directed towards precisely what you're describing, that is cleaning up radioactive contamination in the general environment, and we'll see if it works. I guess this is uh, to speculate a bit more. What do you see in a world where coal fusion is abundant, where it's available to people? Is there the danger of it becoming hyper-weaponized and causing more bad than good? Or in general, do you see it as a, a liberator? Well, all are either applied for good, for the advancement of civilization, or they're applied for war, for the destruction of civilization. It, 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 this always happens. It will not change with cold fusion. The efficient energy, of course, gave us the ability to make energy that is independent of uh, oil and coal, the consequences of CO2 production, but it also gave us the nuclear bombs. Fortunately, we've managed that duality uh, fairly well so far. Cold fusion will have that same duality. The, the, cold, the energy that cold fusion promises for good has the potential to save mankind from the consequences of global warming and allow us to explore the solar system. The present energy sources do not allow us to leave the Earth very uh, effectively. This energy would allow us to, to essentially explore the solar system and eventually the universe. It would also allow us to make clean water, which is a real problem in many areas on the Earth. And it would also allow us to grow food at, at a, at much more effectively. So all of those things are on the good side. Now on the bad side, the energy will allow laser weapons to be developed. Right now, laser weapons are developed to the point where they can shoot down airplanes and can in fact kill, but they require a huge power supply and, and have to be very localized. Once cold fusion becomes available in a backpack size uh, energy source, every soldier could have a, a laser weapon that would be able to uh, kill at you know several miles with practically no aiming whatsoever. It would also allow other uses in war that would make war more, more deadly and more effective. So, yeah, we're going to have to deal with that duality. And because cold fusion is an order of magnitude more significant than even fission energy, that duality will be orders of magnitude more difficult to deal with. So that's something that we have to, I mean, we, we have the possibility it will, it will just allow mankind to destroy itself, or we have the possibility it will allow mankind to grow far better and go further than ever before. That's our choice. You brought up uh, Russia a little bit earlier, and I've noticed from my reading, just into alternative energies, alternative technologies, and so on, there seems to be this kind of east-west divide. And interestingly enough, the stereotype of Russia is one where it's very locked down and very regimented, etc. But it seems that I, an abundance of exotic investigations and experimentation and theories are coming out of that country. And I was just wondering maybe if you had some insight into misunderstandings in regards to the research they carry out there, how they're allowed to uh, investigate things that we shed ourselves off from, anything in regards to that. 
fortunes are much more uh, open to new ideas, uh, strangely enough, perhaps not in a political uh, sense, but certainly in a scientific sense, and in a social sense to some degree, than is the United States. The United States is very much uh, focused on a particular way things are done. We have very strong institutions here that do not like to be changed or threatened. We have tremendous power in the wealth uh, in certain very um, local areas. There are certain individuals and certain uh, businesses that simply don't like to be changed. Uh, Russia has suffered so much change, has suffered uh, so much essential disaster over the centuries that it, I guess, is more sympathetic to looking for new ideas. The institutions aren't there to prevent them from being implemented, or at least until recently. So, yes, I very much admire the, the Russian uh, science, the ability to uh, explore new ideas, and, and they, in fact, have the potential to advance cold fusion uh, significantly faster than, than in the United States because they don't have those institutions that would fight it quite so vigorously. Now, you currently run Kiva Labs. Is that run out, out of your home? What I call it. It's a, a descriptor rather than an entity exactly. I mean, it's an entity from a legal point of view, but it's essentially a two-man operation. It's myself here in Santa Fe and it's Brian Scanlon in Greenwich, Connecticut. We both have uh, our own separate laboratories. Brian funded a lot of this work uh, for a while, but we're working together, but but uh, separately. And that is called Kiva Labs. Now, have you followed the work of, say, Mitchell Schwartz and Geez, his name's escaping me. Hagelstein, Peter Hagelstein. What What do you think of what they're doing at MIT, and are they on the verge of anything? Well, they are a significant con contributor to the field. Uh, Peter in terms of theory, and uh, Mitchell Schwartz in terms of the experimental work. They have discovered uh, aspects of cold fusion that are uh, important. They have been... Oh, important. They have made contributions in helping educate people about what's happening in the field by setting up these uh, conferences and colloquium and, at MIT. So I, I admire the efforts that they are, are making, They're just like the rest of us, trying to deal with a difficult situation as best we can. Now, the degree of importance that each of us uh, has to the field is for history to decide at this point. I suppose we can start wrapping up a little bit. Maybe we can just touch on what your current projects are outside uh, within your lab or maybe what conferences you're going to be attending in the near future, uh, what your plans are in general. The uh, next conference is in Venice, Italy, in a year and a half. Uh, I will definitely attend that, provided I'm <laughs> still still uh, healthy and, and uh, being supported in the field. My present efforts are to demonstrate the validity of my theory, to explain it more clearly, because apparently it is not as easy to, to understand as I thought it would be, and eventually write another book, uh, bring my current book up to date, and a address theory in more detail because I believe at this point that the problems in the field really have to be addressed by theory. We've gotten enough experimental information now to prove that the effect is real. We've got enough now to provide the evidence, the, the uh, raw material that can be used by theory. But at this point, the absence of the theory not only leads to skepticism, because after all, they say, you know, you can't explain it, so it can't be real, but also it makes it very difficult to interpret the experimental work. It makes it difficult to plan new experiments. I mean, all, all scientists in their laboratory have a theory. They have a theory in their mind. 
and it may not be the conventional theory, it, it may not be complete, but they have a theory in their mind that guides what they do and, and that also relates to what, how they interpret what they see. And if what's in their mind is wrong, then of course their interpretations will be wrong and what they plan to do next will be in effect. And to some extent that's the case with cold fusion. The, the various theories clearly are inadequate. They, many of them are clearly wrong and that handicaps the field. So we've got to start looking at, discussing, thinking about, and proposing better theories. Already done that, creating better experiments. Now we have to start doing it to the theory. And, and that's what I'm hoping to help with some of my ideas. What are some predictions that your theory makes and maybe how can you validate them? Well, theory has several, what well, we call them stages to it. The first stage is to create a, a, an assumption. All theory is based upon assumption. You hope that the assumption is correct. I mean, for example, there was a time when the theory of the Earth's sun was that the sun went around the Earth. And that assumption was later found to be wrong. And now we know that the Earth goes around the sun, and the theory that then that assumption, which is no longer an assumption, is based upon is correct. So all theory starts with assumption. If the assumption is wrong, then the theory will re be wrong no matter how clever the math is. So you have to start with the right assumptions, and I, that's what I'm trying to do. I've proposed five different assumptions and their justification. Now, any theory that is at odds with an assumption that you now believe to be true, that theory must also be wrong. If it's at odds with, with an assumption that you know to be true, the theory has to be wrong. So you can go through the various theories and decide whether or not they agree with the assumptions. And then once you have a theory that does agree with the assumptions, you can test it by making predictions. And I make a variety of predictions as to what I would expect to see happen if you do X, Y, and Z to a sample. And at this point, I'm testing to find out whether my predictions will come true. And I'm asking other people to look at their, when, when it, you have to make excess energy, of course. I mean, it doesn't do any good to study a system that is not making excess energy. <clears throat> you have to study a system that is actually working. Well, not that's hard to have happen because the reproducibility is not all that good in some cases. But for those people who have successfully made excess energy by whatever method, I'm saying, okay, this is what you should look for. You should look for tritium production if you're using light hydrogen. And if you find tritium production during, using light hydrogen, then this supports my model. Also, if you treat your material in such a way that you would expect to make these micro cracks, the nano cracks, then that would support my theory. And then I, can, I have a variety of other predictions that I won't go into in detail. But in any case, that's the goal of any kind of test with theory. First of all, check the assumptions, and second, then check predictions. All right, Dr. Storms, in wrapping up, maybe would you like to let the audience know a good source of information for either getting uh, into this topic or for building up their knowledge if they already have some kind of foundational groundwork? The, the, the available in great detail on the internet, you can go to the website lenr.org and there you will have access to the literature. You can search it based upon keywords and in addition to the author, <clears throat> and you can download many of the uh, papers in full text, or you can certainly get access to the citations where you can then look them up elsewhere. There are also uh, reviews there, and also photographs of apparatus, interviews with uh, individuals. <clears throat> so that, that's a good place to start. And then, of course, you can buy my book, the science of new, uh, the science of low energy nuclear reaction, which is available available on Amazon. dot com. So those those are the places I would go, and then of course 
once you find a suitable review, and, and these reviews, by the way, that are on the website go from truly scientific reviews requiring some technical background to reviews that almost anyone uh, who's generally interested in science uh, can understand. So that, that would be the place to start. And also I think worth mentioning is uh, coldfusionnow.org. They're a tremendous resource. They have compiled a lot of a listing of the best books, about, uh, the best literature, and also a number of your videos on that site for, for people to reference and to look at for themselves. I think we'll end there. Dr. Storms, I really appreciate your time. This has been a very intelligible and illuminating discussion, so thank you very much. Well, thank you, John.